Hi everybody, welcome to another Spectrum Economics video. Today I'm going to be talking about indifference curves. As you can see here from the picture, that's me feeling indifferent between having a banana and an orange. Sure. Okay, but in reality, of course, I prefer bananas. Always have been a real big banana fan. Have banana smoothies, banana pancakes, and you know, sometimes just eat the banana neat. But anyway, so what are indifference curves? So I've talked about utility um, a few videos back, as well in a, as well as in a post. So indifference curves is basically it is um, a combination of goods or services that actually give you the same level of utility. The diagram here shows an example of an indifference curve. So we have got two goods, good A and good B. So you know, they could be anything, you know, you could be creative or whatever. But this just shows the relationship between the two goods. As you can see here, that the curve is actually convex to what we call the origin. So it's got that curve, or you might say it looks kind of concave if you look at it from the other perspective. But anyway, we refer to it as being convex to the origin. So why is it this convex shape? So that basically shows you that you're better off having a combination of good A and B rather than having all of good A or all of good B. That, of course, is going to vary depending on the relationship between those goods. So that's what I'm going to explain next. So let's take a look at a number of indifference curves. So we've got IC1, IC2, and IC3. IC1 is highly convex to the origin. IC2 is Still convex, but not as convex, and IC3 is a straight line. So why would you get those differences between them? So in other words, you can look at it in terms of diminishing marginal utility. So as you get more and more of A and more and more of B, the utility that you obtain from either of these goods actually diminishes. So as I mentioned before, you're actually better off with a combination of A and B. If you look at indifference curve 2, IC2, you don't have diminishing marginal utility to the same extent, so you can still keep consuming the same good and you don't lose that much value in it you know maybe it's like eating chips chip number one chip number two chip number three eventually you get sick of chips but as uh, you can actually eat quite a few before you actually start getting sick of them and we got ic3 so this and uh demonstrates that there isn't any real loss in utility or uh, in respect to each other that's another thing as well you have to remember use of indifference skills obviously is sometimes in respect to each other, in respect to A and in respect to B. So it's not necessarily respect to the wider world. So that gets a little bit more complex. But anyway, this is just to give you an idea of the different shape and difference curves you can have. A straight line could also indicate that the two goods are perfect substitutes. So you have a good A and good B. So for example, you consume more and more of good A and you may still have diminishing utility. But as you consume B as well, you're also getting diminishing utility of A too, because basically A and B are fulfilling the same needs. Here we have an L-shaped curve. So what does that mean? Typically, you get this sort of shape when your goods are perfect complements. So, for example, you can't really have one without the other. As I mentioned in one of my other videos and posts, you get, for example, a DVD player and a DVD. So there's no point having a DVD if you have no access to any DVD player. So you can accumulate more and more and more DVDs, but they have no value unless you also have a DVD player. So that would be in the ratio of one DVD player to effectively several hundred uh, DVDs. But you would, but if you didn't have the DVD player in the first place, you would get zero utility. That might not be the best example, but I've got another example coming up I'll explain to you. Okay, going back to substitutes again, here we have Coca-Cola and we have Pepsi. Can you have one after the other. You could do, you could have a Pepsi and you could then yeah, have a drink of Coca-Cola. But if you've already drunk a Pepsi, you probably won't get as much value out of drinking your Coca-Cola, simply because the Pepsi, as a certain extent, has quench your thirst if you're thirsty, or if you're craving a particular taste, then Pepsi's probably more or less addressed that as well. Coca-Cola may still have some value to you if it's your second drink, but not as much as if it had been your first drink. And if it is like your third or fourth drink, then you probably wouldn't want any Coca-Cola at all. Here we have another example of what we call perfect complements. That is shoes. There's no point having 20 left shoes and no right shoes. Basically, because of the shape of your foot, you know, you try fitting your right foot into a left shoe. It feels terribly uncomfortable. So basically, you need to have a left and a right shoe. And that is probably a better example than my DVD DVD player, where you've got a ratio of one is to one DVD player tells how many DVDs you have. But here with the shoes, it's a very obvious case you have to have one as to one. 
So, for example, you have zero utility from 20 right shoes and no left shoes. Whereas you can have five right shoes and five left shoes, it would be a good match. Five left shoes with 10 right shoes, you again, you wouldn't get any additional value from those extra five right shoes. Again, they have to come in pairs, and mostly you'll see in shops they are sold as pairs. As far as I know, I don't know too many shops that just sell left shoes and just sell right shoes. If we add a budget constraint to our indifference curve, we can actually determine the optimal output that we should have. So as you can see here, we put in a budget constraint, and where the budget constraint runs tangent to your indifference curve, that would be where you get your optimal level of A and B. And of course, depending on the price of A and B, it will determine your um, gradient of your budget constraint. So if the price of good A, for example, went down, then in a sense you would have a steeper curve and you'd probably buy more of good A and less of good B, and so on and so forth. So as it's changing, you get a different tangent because um, the gradient of your indifference curve is constantly changing as it's going around in the level of curvature. Now I'd like to introduce to you two other concepts and um, some of you have been following some of my other videos, some other posts, you might be a little bit familiar with these and that is substitution effect and income effect and using your indifference curves and your budget constraints you can actually demonstrate what the substitution and income effect is of a price change. So let's have a look at what we got here. So as you can see we got the green line so that actually shows your budget constraints. You've got budget constraint 1 and budget constraint 2. So what's happened here is the price of good B has fallen. As you can see, there's been a shift outwards to budget constraint 2, whereas the price of good A has remained the same. So basically, so what's happened now, instead of having A, which is our original equilibrium, it's now moved out to B. So as you can see here, less of good A now is being consumed and more of good B is being consumed. And this can be broken down into what we call a substitution and income effect. So we get our budget constraint 2, and then we run another line parallel. That's the red line here. And that line parallel has to be tangent with your original indifference curve. So as you can see here, we've now got a point C. So at point C, as you can see, we're moving from A to C. So for good B, the movement from A to C is your substitution effect, which is positive. And the movement from A to C for good A, as you can see, is actually negative. Because people are moving from good A to good B because of that price change. And that is, in fact, your substitution effect. There's also what we call an income effect. Because once the price has fallen, your real income has actually increased. You can actually buy more of the same or even different stuff with the same nominal income. But real income, because of the price fall, you are actually better off. So what is that income effect? So as you can see, we go from C to B. So for good B, again, there's an increase in the amount of good B consumed or bought. So we can see income effect is positive. So therefore, we would define good B as a normal good. And we can look at good A as well. Income effect has also resulted in more of good B. So you're going from C to B. So again, we can see that there's also an income effect as well, which is also positive. So good A can also be considered as a normal good. An inferior good, or even a given good, as I explained in another video, you'd get slightly different income effects. In fact, with an inferior good, you would see a negative, impact, a negative income effect. And you can look at that in terms of both good A and good B by using this indifference curve analysis. This brings me to the end of my video on indifference curves. I hope you found it useful. I've got several other posts relating to demand and supply and also utility as well that you can go and have a look at. Some of them are videos, some of them are more detailed posts. I've also got a, a post on indifference curves as well. So that's actually explained in a write-up. So you can use this video to supplement that if you choose. But anyway, thank you for watching, and hopefully uh, you'll be watching a few of my videos. If you're on DTube, remember to follow, and also remember to upvote if you like this video as well. I have plenty more to come. Also, I almost forgot, in addition to this, you'll see some questions here in the write-up. I'm not sure if it is, appears on DTube, but it will appear on Steemit anyway. I think there should be two questions there relating to the video. So if you liked the video you watched it, you shouldn't have too much of a problem in terms of getting these answers correct. So participation, I will be giving you upvotes. And also, if you get the first person to get the correct answer for both the two questions, I will be giving you one Steam back dollar. Again, thank you very much and look forward to seeing more of you guys.